Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the church is going to kill for sure. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> Sam, did you use your right card? I did. It's not as many on this side. We're glad you're here. In Sunday school, we had 26. And we'd love to invite all of you to come back to us next Sunday, about an hour earlier, and be in our Sunday school. Our Sunday school offering was $1,250. And birthdays, I had a couple this year, Miss Savon and Tommy Aiken. So, did, have any, did anyone else have a birthday that I didn't have this year? Somewhere inside that wonderful device lived an amazing person. Her name was Information Please. And there was nothing she didn't know. She could supply anybody's number at the correct time. My first personal experience with this genie in the bottle came one day while my mother was visiting a neighbor. I'm using myself at the tool, tool bench in the basement. In the basement, I whacked my finger with a hammer. The pain was terrible as I ran through the house holding my throbbing finger. The telephone, I thought. Quickly, I ran from the footstool in the parlor and dragged it to the landing. Climbing up, I unhooked the receiver and held it to my ear. Information, please, I said. A click of two letters, and the voice said, Information? I hurt my finger, I wailed in the phone. Tears came readily now that I had an audience. Isn't your mother home, came the question. Nobody's home but me, I cried. Are you bleeding? The voice asked. No. I hit my thing with a hammer and it sure hurts. Open your refrigerator and get a little piece of ice and hold it to your finger, said the voice. After that, I called information please for everything. <laughs> I asked her for help with my geography. She told me how to find Philadelphia. She helped me with my math. She told me my pet chipmunk would eat fruits and nuts. Then there was a time Petey, our pet canary died. I called information police and told her the sad tale. She listened and said the usual things grown ups say to soothe the child. I asked, why is it that birds should sing so beautifully and bring joy to families, only to end up as a heap of feathers at the bottom of the cage? She must have sensed my deep concern, for she said quietly, Paul, always remember that there are other worlds to sing in. Somehow I felt better. Another day I was on the telephone. Information police. Information said the now familiar voice. How do you spell fix? Hmm. Think anybody would need help spelling fix? Yes. <laughs> uh, all this took place in a small town in the Pacific Northwest. When I was nine, we moved across the country to Boston. I missed my friend very much. 
she belonged in an old wooden box back home. And somehow I never thought of trying to tall, shiny new phone that sat on the table in the hall. As I grew into my teens, the memories of those childhood conversations never really left. In the moments of doubt and per per perplexity, I would recall the serene sense of security I had then. I appreciated how patient, understanding, and kind she was to have spent time with a little boy. A few years later, on my way west to college, my plane went down in Seattle. I had about a half hour to so between planes. I spent 15 minutes or so on the phone with my sister. Then, without thinking what I was doing, I dialed my hometown operator and said, Information, please. Miraculously, I heard the small, clear voice I knew so well. Information. This is several years later, and he's going to college. I had planned this, but I heard myself saying, Could you please tell me how to spell fix? There was a long pause, then came the soft answer. I guess your finger must have healed by now. I laughed. So it really is still you. I wonder if you have any idea how much you meant to me during that time. I wonder, she said, if you know how much your call meant to me. I never had any children, and I always loved hearing your voice when you called. It was very satisfying. I look forward to it. I told her how often I thought of her over the years and asked if I could call her again when I came back to visit my sister. Please do, she said. Just ask for Sally. Three months later, I was back in Seattle. A different voice answered information. I asked for Sally. Are you a friend, she said. Yes, a very dear friend, I answered. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, she said. Sally had been working part-time the last few years because she was sick. She died about five weeks ago. Before I could hang up, she said, wait a minute, what's your name? Is it Paul? I said, yes. She said, she left a message for me. She wrote it down in case she called. Let me get it and read it. The note said, tell Paul that I still say there are other worlds to sing in. You'll know what I mean. I thanked her and hung up, and yes, I knew exactly what she meant. I'm sure her sweet voice is part of the heavenly choir praising our heavenly father right now. My sweet story of a long time ago. I have copies of the page by this one. I'll turn it over to Sam. A song stand and sing in number 624. Since Jesus came into my heart, a song stand. <laughs>
here this morning. Tell someone you're glad they're here. Good to see you, Mark. Good to be in the Lord's house together. Good to be back with you. Being out last Sunday and uh, wedding went great. Weather stayed good. I just wish the distance for me to hike had been a little bit short. <laughs> so, but everything went well, and they're on their honeymoon. So, be prayer for Jenny and Adam, and lift them up in your prayers. Uh, House and Grounds committee meeting after services this morning, so be mindful of that. And uh, work day planned for Saturday, May 7th. That's a week from yesterday. No, two weeks from yesterday. So be mindful of that. And women on mission meeting, we got a correction there. It's oh. at 10.30, not 9.45. So make it, make that note, change the time of meeting, 10.30, this Thursday. So be mindful of that. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Y'all pray for me. I'm still recuperating from this trip. <laughs> when you're diabetic and you have to deal with sugar issues, and uh, I'm still still not getting there yet. So. Too much sugar? No, I'm not sure. Oh, I get plenty of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, I'm still not... Well, but it's good to be in the Lord's house. Good to see you later this morning. Any, any other announcement? Miss Sandy, turn it back over to you. <coughs> turn to him number 81. He leadeth me a blessed thought. Him number 81.
Let's sing the first and last verse. 230, the first and last verse.
288. One day. Let's read the responsive reading. 288. Let us stand as we read and as we sing. 288. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows neither the angels in heaven or the Son, except the Father only. So this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. <coughs> then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Therefore be alert, since you don't know what day your Lord is coming.
want to ask you a question. How many remember the text for last Sunday morning? How many of you were here last Sunday morning? Part of the time. Part we didn't. John 19. John 19, okay. I didn't have a text last Sunday morning, but y'all did. And uh, so I don't know what Brother Randy Cruz preached on, but I'm going to preach on back to Mary Magdalene. Back in 2006, the world was going through the uh, a novel written by Dan Brown entitled The Da Vinci Code. <coughs> in a little over a year uh, of its publication, it had 60 million copies sold. Very prominent uh, biography. Uh, biographical material. But in the book, Brown speculates that Mary and Jesus had a relationship, got married, and had a son. Now, I will rule that as radical because there is no biblical evidence to that fact. But there are some things about Mary Magdalene that we can learn from Scripture outside of the heresy of some other people. So in John chapter 20, I want to begin reading verse 1 and read on through verse 16. <clears throat> the first day of the week, this is the, after the crucifixion of Christ. This is, he's been in the grave. He has died. He's been buried. And Mary Magdalene came to the sepulcher early when he was yet dark. And seeing the stone taken away from the sepulcher, she then run and they come to Simon Peter and to John the beloved apostle and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. <coughs> then this Paul's right there for a moment. If Mary and Mary had a close relationship with Jesus, she was one of the women who supported his ministry along with Mary's mother and others who traveled with him. And she would have heard Jesus' conversation about, you put me in the grave and in three days I'm going to come out again. So she understood and had heard Jesus' teaching. So why is she worried now about a missing body? She's coming to, the tomb is empty, Jesus is not there. Why is she worried about it? If she had heard Jesus say, that he is, would rise again. Now let me, let's make a conversation here together. How many of you have lost loved ones who have been buried in a cemetery someplace? If you go to that cemetery this afternoon and the grave of your loved one is open and they've risen from the dead, what would be your first thought? It would be just like Mary Magdalene. One who has stolen the body of my loved one? We would not think of the possibility of resurrection. Even though Jesus had said, you kill me in three days, I will rise again. And in fact, in this passage of Scripture, if you look at it, go down the passage and I'll read all of it. Uh, when Je in verse 11, when Mary came back the second time to the tomb, she was stood outside the tomb weeping. The word weeping there is a word that means to wail. She is, she's weeping and she's wailing and she's weeping and she's wailing. She is heartbroken that the body of her Lord has been taken. Now she has gone through the trauma of the Passion Week. When you stop and think about what Jesus went through before he went to the cross. Jesus went through great agony and pain and suffering rejection of his own people and, and his disciples had pretty well deserted him except for John the beloved apostle and Mary. And I think Peter stood afar off during all this incident as he has denied his Lord three times with an oath. And so the trauma of Passion Week is enough and now to come to the tomb and find it empty and where is the body of Jesus? When Jesus appears to her, he, she doesn't know it's Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Why doesn't she know that it's Jesus? Pain. 
apparently he's not revealed different. to her yet. Okay. Apparently he he looked different. Well, she, she he looked different because she's weeping and crying. She she has her eyes filled with tears. She is not expected. She she's expected to find a dead body, not a alive gardener. Do you get that? So she's not a thinking that Jesus is alive. Jesus is dead. And she says to this person whom she perceives to be the gardener, where have you laid him? You must have taken his body and hid it somewhere. Where did you take it? I will take care of this situation. So Mary number one is, her sorrow is meaningless. Do we ever sorrow over things because of our presumption about what's going on? She's perceiving, she's making the assumption his body is stolen. <coughs> and she's assuming that somebody has stolen the body of Jesus. <coughs> if you remember the story, the Roman guards were placed at the tomb and the tomb was sealed with the seal of Pilate. And he said to them, the, the centurion said, you watch this too. You take care that nobody takes his body away. They were assuming, the Roman leadership, that the, G, the disciples would come and take Jesus' body away and then claim that he was risen again. And so when this begins to happen, they are really concerned about it. Look at verse 11 and 12 with me. When Mary came back the second time to the tomb, she gone to Peter and John. They have run to the tomb. John outruns Peter, but he stops short of going in, and Peter, headlong, just keeps running right on into the tomb, and he says, hey, something's happened here. His body's gone off. The mouth of it is the, the sheet in which he was wrapped in the napkin at the end. And I preached on that napkin. Look at verse 7. It says, And the napkin that was about his head now lay him with a little cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Miss Gray, have you ever thought why the napkin was laying separately from the rest? <coughs> in the custom of eating that day and time, you had napkins. And when you got through with the meal, you just balled it up and threw it down. But if you were not through, and you were coming back to the table, you would fold the napkin and lay it down. Jesus was saying, folks, I'm coming back again. Praise the Lord. Amen. The tomb is empty. Amen. Jesus is alive. Amen. And when we think about Easter today, we think of it in a whole different perspective than Mary did. Mary went to the tomb expecting to see a battered, bruised body. She was not expecting to see her Savior alive and well on planet Earth. And so she's weeping, she's wailing, she's heartbroken because she's still going through the passion of death, burial of Jesus Christ. Not the resurrection, because she's not expecting the resurrection. Now look at that verse 12. And when she looked in the tomb the second time, she saw what? Two angels. What did the angels ask her? Well, what do I witness that? All of heaven is wondering, why are you weeping, Mary? Let me make a, let me make a statement to all of us who are here. All of us have lost loved ones who have been saved by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Why do we weep over them? It's for us. Really. Why do we, we're weeping for ourselves, folks. My dad spent eight weeks in the hospital before he died. I would not have wanted to bring him back to that condition. But I wept for myself because I was losing someone that I loved and cared for. So we need to get our perspective on what's true in our life. And the angel said, why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, in verse 13, and I know not where they have laid him. Somebody has stole the body of Jesus. Where is he? I can hear her now. In her anguish, in her 
wailing and her weeping. She wants to know where is his body? Jesus has risen. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Listen. Sometimes in our weeping and wailing, we miss the victory that is just present in our life. Here is Jesus in his resurrected body standing just a few feet from Mary. And she's asking, where is Jesus? Where is his body? I want to find him. And he's right there. Sometimes in our weeping and our wailing, we miss the presence of Jesus who's always near to us. One of the great hymn writers that has written many hymns, and I think there are like two in our, in our book, is a man by the name of William Cowper. Let me find this. William Cowper was struggled with depression and mental illness throughout much of his life. But through the darkness of his struggle, he wrote us some great hymns. And here's one that he wrote. God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Jed, judge not the earth from feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. In the midst of our weeping and our wailing, Jesus says, I'm here. I'm here to comfort you and strengthen you. One of the other great hymn writers of our faith is a woman by the name of Fanny Crosby. I think there are like 16 hymns in our hymn book written by Fanny Crosby. Somebody tell me the story of Fanny Crosby. She was blind. At about six, was it six months or six years? Six months old, she had to have surgery. And the doctor messed up in the surgery and she went blind at the age of six months of age. Now, what would you have done if the doctor messed up the surgery and you had a child that went blind at six months of age? How would you have felt by the doctor? Wait till I get a hold of him. Wait till I get a hold of his neck. Fanny Crosby writes in one of her biographies, said, if I could meet the doctor now, I would say, thank you, thank you, thank you. For out of her blindness, she wrote great hymns of faith. Out of the darkness of her life, she perceived the presence of God in a real and mighty way. You know, we've sung over 2,000 years from the resurrection of Christ. We could have been like Mary. We could have gone to that tomb. And we could have saw that it was empty, that, that, that the binding was there and the napkin was there. And we could have said, where is he? I want to tell you where he is. He's right here today Amen. in our midst. Amen. He is alive and well on planet Earth. And he's coming back again. Amen. The question is, are you ready for him to come back? The only thing that really makes a difference in life is what have you done with Jesus? Amen. Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Is he real to you? Or do you weep and wail over all the circumstances of life and wonder what in the world is going on? But God wants us to experience, number one, His victory in our life. His victory is that He is risen. Why don't you look at this passage again? Go down to verse 16. Jesus as what she perceives to be the gardener. Says unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest you? Who are you looking for? 
And she, supposing that he was a gardener, verse 15, says, Sir, if thou hast borne him with hence, let me know where thou hast laid him, and I will take care of him. I will deal with this problem. I will solve the issues. I'll take his body and I'll take care of it. She'd been one of the women on that morning who'd come to anoint him with spices. The other women had gone back to their homes when they found the tomb empty. And Mary's the only one. In fact, remember this. Mary is the first person to see the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Of all the people that Jesus read, she is the first one to see Jesus alive. And in this scene, she's talking to him what she perceives to be the gardener. In verse 16, And Jesus said unto her, Mary. He calls her by name. He gets personal with her. Kind of like the story Brother Joel read this morning. This woman recognized the voice of the caller. Jesus, we recognize Him when He calls us by name. And at that point, notice what she says in that verse. She says unto Him, Rabboni, which is to say Master. She come looking for a body. She left with the Spirit of Christ in her life. She left with the victory in life. She, was, <clears throat> she had already been a changed person because Christ had delivered her from the demons that afflicted her. But now, she's experiencing the personal presence of Christ in life. She is experiencing His victory. But not only that, she's experiencing His presence. How many of you know the presence of Christ in your life? Amen? Amen. Amen. There's nothing like it in all that we do. Now, verse 17 is not a part of my text this morning, but Mary, in that moment, when Jesus said, Mary, she immediately recognized him. She called him Master. And she goes to put her hands upon her feet, on his feet. In verse 17, it says, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to thy brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto the Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. In other words, she's not saying, don't touch me. She's simply saying, you've got a job to do, and I've got a job to do. Go tell my brethren. Now remember, two of those brethren had already come to the tomb in this passage of Scripture. Peter and John came, they saw the tomb, and they left scratching their heads. What has happened? But he said, Mary, go tell them that I am about to ascend back to heaven and to my, my father and to what? Your father. My God. Your God. Folks, out of a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have all that heaven has for us right now. The Bible says that it's never entered into the hearts and minds of God's people what God has prepared for them who love Him. If I say the word heaven today, what, what is your imagination of what heaven's going to be like? It's going to be a garden with all kinds of fruit, a few thorns, no, no thorns. It will be more wonderful than we can even imagine. If you take all of our imaginations and put them all together, folks, it doesn't need to scratch the surface to whatever it's going to be like. And Jesus said, I'm going back to the Father. I'm going to send back to heaven. And then he says in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus is preparing heaven for us as believers. Amen? Amen? And so one of these days, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and John and all the others, we're going to gather in heaven and celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. God's going to...
feed us. God, we're going to feast on Him. We're going to feast on the victory that He's enabled us. We're going to feast in His presence forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I can just go on and say that forever. God's loss is going to be eternal. We're going to be in the presence of God. Verse 18 says this, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples, I have seen Jesus. Here we are, we understand Easter through the reality of what the Word of God tells us. But put your place in Mary Magdalene in that day and time. She went to the tomb expecting to find a body. A battered, bruised body. That had been crucified on a cross. And when she got there, the body was not there. And she immediately began, where have they taken him? I want to find the body so I can take care of it. But she found something much more important. She said, I've seen Jesus. Have you seen Jesus? Amen. Do you see Jesus? When you weep and you wail because of the sorrows that come in life, do you see Jesus? Many times we ask, well, where are you, Lord? He's right here. He's standing beside me. No matter what I go through, no matter the hardships that we go through, He's right here. His presence and His victory is always with the born again child of God. Give Him praise and honor and glory for that. Have an everyday Easter in your life. You see, Easter is, we celebrate Easter one day a year, but folks, every day is an Easter day. Because the presence of God walks with us, regardless of what we go through in life. Amen? Let's bow together to pray as Sandy comes to lead us in our hymn of everything. Father, we thank you for your love and your blessings and your goodness. Thank you, Lord, Father, for this day. Thank you, Father, that Jesus is alive. And we give you praise and honor and glory. In the sweet name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. What number, please, man? 414, let's stand together to sing.
you rose from the grave. That we serve a risen Savior, as the Lord says to us in his word in the psalm. We pray, Father, your blessings upon Brother Lynn and upon uh, Ms. Manda and upon all of the members, all of us in this congregation. Be with this one father who will have surgery this week. Be with others who may be sick. Be with the needs of our Father, of all that are in need of your salvation and in need of your restoration to help them in their homes. We thank you now and go with us in this day and praise you, God, for being our Savior, our Lord, and our God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.